Disruptors and Curious Minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper, where we get to try to imagine what the future is going to look like with uh, principles of the past as they evolve uh, throughout all kinds of disciplines, through time, through space, and creative energy. Uh, we've got an amazing guest today. We're excited. My name is Jeremy. This is Mark. Uh, this is Thinking on Paper. Mark, how are you today? I am beyond excited for today's show it's been a, a, a long time in the works hasn't it to get to the first of july but we made it time always has that inextricable habit of coming to fruition doesn't it so yeah there it is there it is well um so before we get started before we jump in um we are we are in the search for sponsors so if you figure in you enjoy what we're doing Hit us up and we can talk about how we can uh, chat with you guys and integrate your message and all that fun stuff. But more importantly, we're helping disruptors and curious minds try to understand where we are headed uh, as a society, um, you know, as as a as a, you know, this collective of people. And we're trying to do it more together. And today we're going to talk about how we do it more together and how we do it through design. And design is actually the way to bring people together and solve really old problems that everyone's been really scared of for a long time. So, Mark, let's jump in. Let's why don't you intro our guest and uh, we'll take it from there. Yeah. So if I show this book, I think a lot of people watching will recognize the cover of this book. It was The Design of Everyday Things was the second book in the Thinking on Paper book club. It was your choice, Jeremy. I have to thank you for it because at the time I think I said as a non-designer, I was dubious and it's changed how I think about design. But the writer of this book, Don Norman, was friends with another writer that we knew. They linked us together and now Don is here on the show to speak about his new book, Design for a Better World, Meaningful, Sustainable, Humanity-Centered Design for a Better World. Don Norman needs no introduction. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Morning, Don. Thanks for being here. Mark, do we want to start with our carryover question? You want to, yeah. uh, as we try to thread our shows together? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, and I'm, uh, I'm worried that I asked this one question. That might be the only question I asked. But um, last week, our guest left you a question, Don. Kieran Murray, he's the founder of a very, very interesting media enterprise. His question for you is, to what extent do you think misconceptions about people or society hold back design? <laughs> I would say, I would rephrase the question. Uh, okay. To what extent does it rephrase society um, because I'm going to, as I will talk about design I want to make sure that people realize that I don't necessarily mean design that's done by someone whose occupation is a designer because everyone is designing and moreover the world was designed over tens of thousands hundred thousand years by people who were changing the world uh, either inventing tools to make life easier or make warfare more deadly or they invented forms of government and they invented the notion of countries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's design. Anytime that people try to modify the way they live or the world or the tools or even how they think uh, in order to change it, usually for what they think is better, uh, that's design. So yeah, all these difficulties in human behavior and belief structures, that is, is one of the barriers to good design but it's really the barrier to getting along in the world. So it's greater than just design. So okay. one one question too, a follow-up question on design. So as humans, as we as we kind of construct the reality as individuals in, in our minds, right? Like what my reality is, what your reality is, what Mark's reality is, we we as humans want to organize things, right? We want to organize things to to generate meaning. Is that kind of how design works in a way are we design is that a is that a design mechanic that we have innately in our bodies well it, isn't that backwards i mean yes that's how the, how we are wired if you will how we learn etc we we form categories even where in nature there are really no strict categories there are no simple boundaries uh and yet we it makes life simpler to assume that we assume simple things. We assume simple causality, that if I do one thing, it leads to another. Well, real causality is much, much more complex. Uh, categories are much more complex. Everything is more complex. Uh, but that's how we get along in the world. And is that a, is that a factor of design? Well, as I said before, uh, yes, but 
look, design comes from people. And so the way people are is, of course, the way design is. So um, I don't distinguish at that level. That's quite a could be a quite damning in, in uh, definition of design because humans are inherently flawed in many, many ways. We have many biases. We have many, many flaws. So vis-a-vis -vis design has many flaws as well. Yes, I think anything designed by people uh, has certain biases and prejudices and, if you will, flaws. But um, part of the design process is to is to recognize that so that um, we, I, here's how you, here's the way you, we design, at least the way I teach and the way most modern designers work. It's not one brilliant person sitting down and saying, I have the idea and then creating it. No. First of all, it's almost always a team. Modern design requires teams of people. And actually, even old fashioned design required teams, except they were never given credit, they were in the background. But second, um, you, we have to figure out what is the real issue I want to address? What is the need I'm trying to address? How do people, are people working? How will they use these new ideas? And I have to say ideas because it isn't always a physical product. It may be an organizational structure. Uh, may, so, um, but then we test it. Because I, I, the way I tell people is, look, I'm a, a world's authority on human behavior, and I will tell you here's how we should do it so that people can use it. But I know better than to believe that. I know that <laughs> quite often I'm wrong. And so what we do is simple prototypes. So we test it, and then that modifies what we're doing, and then we make a slightly better prototype. You know, the first prototype could be a piece of paper. You know, I wanted to make a little device that's about this big, and we're going to carry it around with us. The first Palm Pilot, some of you may remember, was done that way, that uh, they made a little piece of wood that was the size of the device they were trying to make and carried it with them all the time. And every so often they wanted to take a note, say, take it out, and they would take a pen, and they would make believe they were writing. Now they, it was a piece of wood, so it wasn't electronic, but it gave them an understanding of how it might work. And that's how you that's how you begin. You make it more and more working, working, working. You, PowerPoint is wonderful for devising um, prototypes of, of digital objects because PowerPoint looks real and you but it isn't. And um, but we change. So we change it and modify it. So that's how we also overcome the biases and, and uh, misinformation that each each person's mind gives by trying it out on as large a group of people as possible. And if you take a look at commercial products, like someone in, like Apple or, or Microsoft releases a new operating system or a new major application, not only do they test it in, internally, but then they'll test it on selected testers, you know, like a, a million of them. But then they release it to the world and oops, there's now a billion people using it and they discover all sorts of new things that they have to modify. But as long as you keep modifying and adjusting, that's how we overcome these issues. I want to, that's, that's awesome. I want to, I want to back up to something you said uh, earlier related to like defining the problem. And I think that is such an important piece to figure out, you know, the design of a solution, right? And, and what can happen, I think, and I, and I think I read this in your book. I also read it in Julio Tino's book is like, our, we want to converge too quickly on a solution because we want to be the smartest person in the room. Uh, on occasion, right? So how can no, we... No, not, no, not, I'm not the smartest person in the room. In fact, one of my rules when I hire people is hire people smarter than me. Uh, and uh, Julio agrees with that too. Julio is a good friend. And so the fact that his book and my book are related, well, I've been talking to him for years as he was developing that book. And he knows my books. So because I was teaching at Northwestern for many years. And he, in fact, he asked me to help set up a design program. So my, yeah, my question wasn't pertaining to you necessarily or, or Julio necessarily, but like humanity in general, don't, isn't that why we struggle with defining problems? Because we, 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 we tend to want to converge too quickly on how to solve them. Is that, is there any truth to that that you've seen based on your work or am I off base? Um, I think that most people would prefer to solve the underlying issues, but uh, in today's commercial world, 
um, there's always this pressure to be out fast, get it out fast before the competition does. And so that often leads to premature release of ideas. But okay. um, I'm, I'm what, a firm believer that when you're given a problem, I, I say I never solve the problem I'm asked to solve because it's almost always the symptoms and not the problem. And it's really important to try to understand the underlying problems because otherwise it'll, if you solve the symptoms, they'll come back. But those underlying issues are very difficult and they're often much more difficult to solve than simply to remedy the symptoms. So, so what is, and I guess this is kind of two questions here. It's why did you write this book, Designed for a Better World? And what is the, the biggest challenge, the biggest problem that we are or should be trying to solve? I mean, it, there's quite a lot of mention of, of climate change and sustainability. And I thought my, perhaps that's the, press, the most pressing matter, but, but it goes further upstream than that, perhaps. Yeah. Um, let me give a short history of why I decided to write the book. Um, one has to do with my age. Um, 88 years old now. So I said, well, how many books more do I have left in me? I don't know. Maybe this is the last one. Who knows? Um, but I also said that if I look back at my past, I've written all these nice books and they help, help the world make things that are easier to understand and easier to use. And that's nice. But wow, the world's a mess. And, and this, the books I'm writing don't deal with it. But if I think about my own history, I started off as an electrical engineer, two degrees in it. And, uh, I ended up accidentally as a psychologist, but what's called a mathematical psychologist at the time I got the degree, which became what's called cognitive psychology today. And, um, but also I then switched from uh, psychology to cognitive science. I started the first cognitive science department in the world. And then I um, retired early. I retired in 1993 and went to Apple where eventually I became vice president of advanced technology where I not only did I have a wide range of things that my team was working underneath me, but I also went off to Congress and testified to help get the very first Wi-Fi band. And I testified to get the today's HD high definition television standards. So I begin to understand how Congress works and the importance of, of not the Congress people so much as their their staff, they're very important to the staff and they're very good, but also how the political process worked. And I said, well, maybe I can, uh, maybe I, this is a different, I have a different point of view than most of the people who have written about it because of this experience. And so I said, let me write about the problems. But gee, I don't have to write about the problems. They're well understood. People have done a really good job. So let me write about the solutions. Oh, it turns out every problem that I'm interested in, there are really good solutions. So I don't have to develop solutions, but how come nothing has happened? How come the United Nations has been meeting for 28 years to discuss climate change? And every year they produce some sort of document, a policy statement that every country in the world must sign and agree on. And that's the trouble since if every country must sign, there's so many compromises that they're sort of empty policies. And, but over 28 years, almost nothing has happened. Well, that's human behavior. And I said, well, gee, maybe I understand human behavior. And so that's what I wrote about. But the main issues, it's, I don't, there were so many issues in the world that you can't name one as the most important, but I think our economic system is one of them. That the economics uh, drive a lot of uh, anti-social, anti-environment conditions. Uh, another one is the way that the Western policy, the Western world has sort of taken over the world. By the way, when we talk about West and East or uh, Northern countries, Southern countries, those are not geographical terms. Uh, they originated geographically, but no, because um, Australia, for example, is one of the Northern powers. Um, and so, but these powers have sort of destroyed cultures all over the world by dominating and saying, well, we know how to do things. Why don't you run your country the way we run ours? Well, these are the problems that, the, that we face in the world. So I presume you're going to ask me about them. <laughs> I'm going to ask you how, how humanity-centered design can help to... I mean, I, I, I don't even know what, what the answer, what we should be thinking about 
doing, reversing these trends, living, with, going forward with these trends, adapting ourselves. I, I don't even know where to begin thinking about it. So how, so you mentioned something interesting, Don, and I think this comes up in your book a, a bunch and in some of your other talks is th this idea of a Western bias in a first stage approach to, to problem solving is how can we create an awareness of that bias and how it's not globally minded in our collective, in our humanity centered problem solving? Well, the, it's interesting because the, uh, the, if you actually read the history of the world, um, most of the early developments took place in the middle of, Middle Asia, Mid Asia, um, and um, that's where that's where, if you will, science and government and uh, new ideas came from, and uh, the early empires were all there, and yet we tend to think of it that it all came from the West. It all came from, uh, from Greece and Roman and Roman Empire, and then moving up through you know Western Europe, but no, that was a secondary. In fact, the Romans used to look east towards Asia uh, for the riches, for the wealth, and for their intelligence and the way people were living. So it isn't just Western, but um, the problem is that we developed, uh, the, in the West, we've developed this very logical way of thinking. And we've decided, and we apply that to everybody. But logic is not the way people think. Logic is not a natural thing in in nature. Logic was invented by philosophers and mathematicians, and it's not at all the way we think. And then there are all sorts of beliefs that seem natural to those of us who are educated and born in the West, like if you can't measure something, then it means you don't understand it. Uh, yeah, well, Lord Kelvin um, said that, except that's not quite what he said. He said, if you can't measure something, you don't understand it. Yeah, that's true. So the economists now force ourselves to measure everything, even things that can't be measured. And we, we put everything in numbers. And once you put things in numbers, they're becoming abstract. You lose sense of the context. And not only that, but the numbers are meaningless often. Because if you can't measure it, well, what do you do? Well, you measure something else that you think is related. And then you th forget that what you've measured is not what you cared about. And, but what Lord Kelvin said was not that. He said, in the physical sciences. Now, the physical sciences have a very important property that mostly, that before we get to quantum physics, let's say classical physics, uh, it's history independent. The, the path that you got to the state doesn't matter. If I drop this pen... I can predict exactly how fast it's be, it'll be going and how much time it will take to hit the bottom. And um, if I do it again and again and again and again, it's always the same. But when we talk about people or any living thing, no, the, the, the history really matters. Try dropping a cat seven or eight times. I mean, yes, it's not going to be the same each time. And so people are very, very path dependent. And our history really determines what we do and how we think. And so when we're born into a society, the way we experience society in our first formative years, we assume is that's the way it is. The way people think, the way people act, the kind of structures we have, the clothes we wear, what we eat, all that seems natural. And it's very difficult when you go and travel to some other weird economy. Today, it's hard to find a new place because they're all based on this Western thought way of thinking. Um, and, but that's not the only way of thinking. And so why are we imposing our Western way on everybody else? Best because we think it's normal, but it isn't for everybody else. And it's all, but what's happened in the educational system, basically, most of the professors in universities across the world were educated in the West, either the United States or Europe. And by now, they can be educated in their own country because that's what they've learned, the European and American way of thinking. And the American way of thinking is similar to the European because our educators also were educated originally in Germany and England and so on. Um, so it isn't, but it... It isn't necessarily natural or appropriate. And 
different people have different ways of living and different beliefs, different belief systems, different religions, different uh, understandings of the nature of God, or in some cases, God's plural. Um, and personally, it's, that's, that makes the life a much richer life and a richer world. It used to be I loved to travel to other countries because I could experience new ways of eating and new ways of living. And that, that went away. Because now when I travel to other countries, they all seem the same. You can't just, in fact, you can forget what country you're in if you're not careful. So, um, you mentioned. Anyway, I'm off and off and off. You, you better interrupt me and get me going. No, because it's great because you're answering all the questions. But um, you spoke about measurements, and one of the one of the things I don't particularly like at the moment is this obsession with measuring happiness, as if the happiness can be measured. And I think this goes back. But you, you wrote part of your book on meaningful and all of these measurements that don't matter, they have no meaning on a deep level. What is meaningful? What should or could we be looking at to measure? Well, what many people don't understand is a whole theory of measurement and there are different kinds of measurements and different kinds of numbers, in fact. Numbers have different powers uh, and, and qualitative assessments are very important and actually can be put on a kind of scale that's what psychologists are good at is doing measurements. In fact, that's what I studied is, is when I was a graduate student is because I worked with people who were experts in measurement theory. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm running a contest right now and the, the software we bought wants you to, to, to judge on uh, judge said the entries on various categories. And when you give a numerical number and then they average those numbers, Etc. And so then you compare different entries by the app, different averages. Well, when you rate something on a rating scale from one to five, say five is a really wonderful, perfect, one is horrible, three is the middle, you can't average those numbers. Those are subjective numbers, they're qualitative. Every party, every, every judge has a different notion of what a five might mean, or what a four, or a three, or a two might mean. And how, what's this? You know that two is better than one and four is better than three. So they're ordered. We call it an ordinal scale. But what's the spacing? The spacing is unknown. And you can't average them. Because uh, some of those numbers may be far apart in, in some measure and close in other measures. Uh, so the kind of ordinal scale is simply uh, ordering. It's like... Um, I, I line everybody up in a row according to their height. And now um, I'll try to find what I'm going to number them according to their height. And now I'll take the mean of the numbers. That doesn't make any sense. And so uh, the scale that measure where the intervals are, are the same from number to number is called an interval scale. The, the, you know, the temperature scale is one of those. But uh, uh, the temperature of... 10 degrees, doesn't matter whether it's Fahrenheit or Celsius, a temperature of 10 degrees is not twice as hot as one of five because where's the zero point? It's different actually for Celsius than it is for Fahrenheit. Now, Lord Kelvin is the one who determined the real zero point is the minus 300 or something degrees because um, there is a real physical moving point when the molecules don't move. That's, that's the definition of zero. And... Um, but it, that's, that's an interval scale. And if you know where the zero is, then we can call it a ratio scale. Because if I know, well, when I measure your height in inches or meters, it doesn't matter. Um, I know that a height of 60 inches is twice as tall as 30 inches. Because I know where the zero is, and I know that the intervals are always the same. But in most important things, we don't know any of that. But we can't order things quite often. And on top of that, we can, it's amazing how the psychologists are really good at asking people, which is better, this or that? And if you do that in enough dimensions, uh, you can actually put together a very nice uh, understanding of the, of the system. So I say the economists always want to measure things. They always want to measure in terms of money. And therefore, they want to optimize the, the numerical value, the monetary value. And... I don't want to optimize money. I want to optimize quality of life. 
And now back to your question of happiness. Well, actually, happiness is only one of the multiple variables in the quality of life. And in fact, happiness is a complex one because, um, you know, when you're happiest, you're happiest when you've had a, a period of unhappiness. And now you have a, a relatively better thing. And that's when you're much more happy than you can't be happy all the time. Because if you're happy all the time, the, the amount of happiness you're having is keeps going down and down and down and down. And so it's the contrast that's really important. So, but psychologists know how to measure quality of life, and they know, and um, a few countries have even tried to do it. But shouldn't we be optimizing the world for quality of life and not for the gross domestic product, which is a meaningless number, which includes how much a country is spending, sometimes for bad and sometimes for good. And if, if a country, if some company in the country spends a lot of money but pollutes the earth, and now the company government, the government has to spend a lot of money to clean up the pollution. Oh, that counts twice. See, I spent money in two ways. And so that's good. No, it isn't. It's a stupid measure. And by the way, leading economists have said that over and over and over again. And there, and I think the worst part of it is not we should substitute a different measure. We should get rid of a single number to try to characterize as some as complex as human beings or how a country works. And so what I'm looking for is a dashboard where you look at what are the most important things in the country about education, health, welfare, uh, and what are the factors that destroy it? Well, you know, polluting the atmosphere or, you know, not, or using poisonous uh, fertilizers or whatever. Um, and that's a dashboard, and that's what I recommend. And it comes from a group of economists, actually, at Oxford. They call it the donut economics, uh, but that's in the book because I also have a philosophy is I don't want to criticize unless I have a better answer. So in the book, I provide better answers. Again, not that I'd invented, but that other people invented uh, and that are, are reputable. I think the quality of life dashboard, that 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 is super interesting because I think, uh, you know, the majority of the population tends to not think about the, you know, when, when they have buy a case of water, you know, plastic bottle water, they buy a case of water, they have a soccer tournament that their kids in or something. And we take it and we're, Hey, we're hydrating our kids, but there's not a lot of immediate visibility into, you know, what throwing those, you know, water, 24 water bottles in the ocean. But like how it's, I love thinking about these things, but the complexity of them and the interdependencies of all of this stuff and the buy-in required on all of this stuff, like that's the, that's the architectural challenges, figuring out how to pull all this stuff together. Like what's, what's the first step in, in getting something like that pulled together? Yep. Plastics are really valuable. Uh, they, they give us a, in many ways, a much better life because you can shape them and use them in many, many interesting ways. Uh, and when they were first invented, um, they've expanded since then, but everybody understood the real value of it, didn't even understand all the different things, ways you can use it. Um, and we didn't appreciate uh, the waste problems that would happen. And, or for that matter, the waste that happens even in their manufacturing. So there are now many, many people trying to overcome that. Now, on the one hand, people say, well, we should always use, well, here's my example. So the, first of all, I use the same glass over and over and over again. But second of all, it's glass, and glass is one of the most easily recyclable. Glass and metals are the easiest to recycle. Paper might come third. Uh, paper, though, is almost invariably weakened as it's recycled, whereas uh, aluminum, for example, is uh, the same as, as you can't distinguish recycled aluminum from uh, new, newly made aluminum things. Uh, and also glass, you may, you may the color may change. <laughs> you buy a lot of glasses, glassware in Mexico, and they're always green or brown. And that's because they're made from discarded beer bottles. But they work just fine. 
So there are a lot of people trying to say, well, maybe we can do plastics differently. We don't have to make them out of oil and we don't have to make them in such complex ways that they can't be recycled or reused. Maybe we can make biodegradable plastics and they're starting to do that. And maybe we can make maybe we can discover chemical ways of pulling apart the, the, the molecules of plastic and sort of recreating the original source. That means we can remake it into anything else we want. And so there are other solutions. The solution that we should all carry around a metal or glass container for our water it doesn't really work because we'll have to carry around many different containers for the many different things in our lives. And um, we don't, it's not always there. So despite the fact that my wife and I are fully against single-use plastics, we end up using a lot of them. Uh, but I think we can change that because that's a choice of what the materials you manufacture out of. And it's a choice of what, how we manufacture the plastic itself. And there are many, many people now working to try to change that. Is it an educational problem that as well, though? Because it's all good and well if we create these things, we design these things. But if all, all our kids are brought up to use 20 water bottles a day, um, and th th this, the idea of a circular economy is great, but if there's nobody adhering to it, um, no, I don't think it's an. I don't think it's fundamentally an educational problem at that level, um, because it, if we had a better solution, I think it would simply get adopted, and, and maybe we'll require some laws. Because suppose that we have really better solutions of stuff that is easy to redo, um, but it might cost more. So companies are going to resist making it. And that's where uh, policies and governments come in. They can simply require you to use the new materials or not to use the old ones. The better way is they shouldn't require what you should use. They should require they should they should require that there's a goal that we're aiming for and you have to you have to fit the goal. If you require it? some specific material, then what you do is you stop innovation. But if you require a particular goal, then you can still innovate in many ways. But I think we could do that. Now, if it's going to cost more, well, that's a price that the countries ought to be willing to pay. And if everybody is forced to follow these rules, then it doesn't change the competitive nature of the business. Because I'm doing things that's good for the world doesn't penalize me because it's more expensive because everyone has to do it. It makes sense. I was just thinking of what when they introduced diesel to, to try to solve that, that. Is that an example of that? And I know that that didn't work out in the end, but that was you, you create these laws. So everyone has to drive a diesel car because it was at the time thought to be better for the environment. Is, is there any other examples of? Um, it was better also? only in the one measure of miles per gallon. And it did, everybody knew it had different kinds of exhausts, different materials. And, but we weren't that sensitive in the early days of diesel. Because, you know, diesel, the man, uh, invented the diesel engine because it was uh, basically more powerful. Okay. It's, uh, it, I don't think you get any argument from me and Jeremy about everything you said, because I think we're on the same page where it, just how, how do we get this message to more people? And what role does humanity centered design playing it looks so like maybe for the, the new listeners who've joined us could you like what is humanity centered design and how does it differ from human centered design and just regular design well let me get out but, um, my standard crib sheet so so this is the book, The Design of Everyday Things, that teaches human-centered design. I, I started off with a book called User-Centered System Design. Um, I decided I didn't want to call people users, but the reason we called it User-Centered sy user System Design, first of all, we thought it would, you had to think about the system. And second of all, UCSD, User-Centered System Design, is the name of the university I was working at, University of California, San Diego. Um, too clever, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
human-centered design has been very important because it really does focus on things that are important to people. The quality of life is basically the result of human-centered design in part, that we try to design for people, understanding how people up think and work and how they understand things. And so I teach it. But I also say this book is wrong. Now, it's not wrong. There's nothing inside the book that's wrong. I still teach the principles here. There are basically four principles. The four principles are just don't solve the solution of, of the issue you're looking at. Try to, try to figure out what caused that and so solve the underlying issues or else the symptoms will come back. And second, you have to have a major focus on people, not on cause, not on this, not on that, but on quality of life for people. Third, you have to take a systems point of view, user-centered system design, uh, realizing that almost everything is interacting with the things around you and so on. And so you have to take a, an account of that system interaction. And finally, when we're, 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 we're designing for people, we don't know enough and people are so varied and clever and manipulative that uh, it may not work the way you would think it will. And so you have to test and iterate. Don't just do one thing and launch it, but try little, little things, do it incrementally and then learn and modify and slowly, slowly uh, improve and improve until you're ready to launch. And you may need different systems for different cultures or different groups of people. So that's the four principles. So what's humanity-centered design? Well, what's wrong about this book and what's wrong about human-centered design is the things it does not talk about. What's wrong is what's left out. And so what's left out is we didn't, um, we didn't think about the harm to the ecological systems of the world or the harm to cultures or the, or the harm to the, you know, the waste products that we produce, which are poisonous and clogging up the oceans and, and the air and the land. So that's the difference. So the, I say there are four major principles, the same four, but modified. So solve the core, not the, not the symptom. That's the same as for both. Second, focus on the system, yes, but focus on the entire system, the ecosystem of people, all living things, all, and the physical environment. So that's an important addition. Third, take a long-term systems point of view recognizing that the complications result from interdependence of multiple parts, in fact, in the distance. Um, because the way we use our modern stuff, well, what's polluting the air when I use my cell phone, well, it's possibly the power station, which is thousands of miles away, which is burning coal to make the electricity, which I'm using for my devices. Quite often, this, the designers who work on digital things say, well, I'm not polluting the air because we're just making, you know, electronic pictures, symbols, et cetera. And I say, well, it, every, every digital product runs on a physical product. And that physical product uses energy. And if we go to modern AI to answer a question, uses a tremendous amount of energy. And then to train the system uses an incredible amount, more than many towns use in the entire year, just to train the one system. So. That's the, uh, the third principle. And the fourth principle is the same as, as human-centered, test, test, and refine. But there's a fifth principle as well. And that is, when we're designing for a society, uh, we don't go in and say, oh, you have a sewerage problem, you have a public health problem, or you have an education problem, or wh whatever. Don't go in and say, here's the solution. People don't like to be told that they're doing things wrong and that here's a better way, some outsider comes in. That's colonialism. That's what the colonialists did. They went to other countries and said, oh, you can't govern the country, we'll govern it for you. You should be proud and happy that we're helping you. No. So the point is the pre that we have to do is we have to design, well, first of all, the people living there know their problems. In human-centered design, we send out the anthropologists and design researchers to go and understand what the real issues are that people are having. Well, we're working in a community. They know their problems. We don't have to send out the anthropologists. But, and, and they're smart people. There are 8 billion people in the world. It's, intelligence is distributed all over the world. They may already be trying to solve their problems, but they need help. First of all, if you're doing a health problem, um, whether it's medicine or public health, 
they need to have uh, better information than they may have. Second of all, the, if you look at the core issues, the core issues are almost always have to require you to go higher up in the chain of government. And uh, they may not have the ability to do that. And so sometimes the outsiders can help them do that. But we go in as advisors and as facilitators, not as <laughs> colonialists. In fact, I, last week I was in Boston at a conference and um, there was this wonderful group at MIT called the D-Lab um, where the woman in charge, A.B. Smith, uh, gave this wonderful talk about how critically important it is not to design for people, but to design with and by people. And I thought her talk was one of the best descriptions of this I've ever heard. And so I'm running a conference myself in November. You can ask me about it later. And I invite her to come in and give that talk at this conference. So that's the difference. By the way, this is these differences are talking about the design process as we normally do it, which is these, but we can design products and, but we can also design communities and laws and policies. And, and these same principles get slightly modified in each of these different areas, but they can be applied. And the humanitarian, humanity centered one is simply a broader approach. And one last thing, because people say, well, yeah, well, what about life-centered? Or why isn't it planet-centered? And, and these all exist, by the way, people at championing them. And I say, look, I wanted to do it in three words. And I wanted to say center design is two of them. So I'm left with one word. <laughs> and if you look at what, they, what people in life-centered or planet-centered are really doing, it's the same thing that I'm talking about. Uh, so we're all together. So I have, I have a question related to like the the overall adoption of this of this philosophy of of humanity centered design and uh, are we able to there, there are two ways that you know there could be like a catacly, uh, catalyst that drives massive adoption because of need maybe more people are dying than are even happening today and there's a need to come together but are we seeing is there an opportunity to look at like little micro epicenters of success in humanity-centered design that we could try to connect and build momentum that way? And if so, what are some examples of these little epicenters of success related to using this philosophy? Well, nice of you to ask that because that's what I'm devoting the rest of my life to. Awesome. Wow, okay. So um, a bunch of people, a bunch of my friends said, oh, Don, you've led a wonderful life and you're well-known in the design circles why don't we gather, get, get some money from donors and they thought they had, they could get a sufficient money. Who we'll offers prizes to people who are doing wonderful things in design, humanity centered design. So we'll get to, to give it to, you know, distinguished people who've done wonderful stuff for a lifetime. Well, first of all, I resisted using my name on the award and I finally gave in. But second, I said, no, I'm not going to give a prize to somebody who's really good and well established. Why? because it doesn't do any difference. It doesn't make any difference. I get big, I bet big prizes now, and so what? It's really nice. I mean, I'm not, not trying to say it's not nice, but I come home and if I look around me, I'd say, oh, I have a new trophy. Where am I gonna put it? And there's no more room. And it doesn't change what I'm going to do. When you're just starting out, that's when you need the reward because you're struggling and you think, and you may not have be succeeding all the time and so getting an award then can make a difference it's so we establish hmm? acknowledgement can be rocket fuel for somebody at the start absolutely in fact it doesn't even require a monetary award the name could be enough in fact i had an early advisor uh he was actually a former student who's struck it rich in uh in the with this with one of the companies so he gives out a lot of money and gives out awards and he said that some of the awards he gives out are career changing. Uh, this is an award for early career academics. So in the field of cognitive science, they look at the PhD theses and they give awards to the, to the most promising ones. And that allows them, it's much easier for them to get jobs. They get, first of all, to get invited. <laughs> the competition is fierce. And so even if you get invited to give a talk and then also to get the job. And so I said, career changing, that's what I want to do. And that's what I'm trying to do. So anyway, we've established, uh, we're a charity, an official United States charity. 
I have a board of directors of five people. I am not the CEO. Um, and second, we have, um, I have 18 advisors from around the world who are helping. And we submitted, we, we sent out notices and to people explaining what we're doing. We're trying to do just exactly what Jeremy was asking about, finding people who are doing these things, small things all around the world. We got nominations from 26 different countries. I also said we should give awards to educational groups. Doesn't have to be a formal university or college, but groups that are educating people to do this kind of work. And uh, we have 22 uh, requests from that. These people are not a contest. If they, if they fulfill the requirements, wonderful. We want every, every place in the world to be part of it. But both groups have to provide evidence. It isn't enough to have an idea. It has to actually be working. It, it, it will be small and tentative, but they need evidence that is actually helping the groups they're working in, and they must have followed the humanity center design principles. And the educational institutions have to, their evidence is not the curriculum, but okay, where, what are your graduates doing? How many graduates are working in this area? And so uh, we're in the middle now of judging the uh, the entries, and we're hoping to finish by by in August, and we'll have a big conference in San Diego in November, where we we bring in together not just the people who won the awards, but the all as many people as we can find from around the world who are doing this kind of work to first of all show people what they're doing, but not just to say, hey, "Look at the wonderful stuff I'm doing," to say, "Here are the difficulties you're going to face," and you know. Here's where I failed and where I learned from that failure. Because I, I want this to be a learning experience. And I make sure we've turned down a lot of people. We, we already weeded out a number of people who weren't ready. And I wrote a personal letter to each one saying why, trying to and say, here's what you could do in the future. And what I'm proud of is the fact that I, I get letters of thanks from the people we turned down. Because, and so... Uh, we are partnering with the Aga Khan Foundation, which is a major foundation. We're doing, they called it human-centered design around the world, mostly in Africa and in Asia. So people in the United States have not heard of them. And But when I looked at what they were doing, I, I flew to Geneva to have a meeting with them. That's their headquarters. Um, I said, you're not doing human-centered design. You're doing what I call humanity-centered design. And so we're actually talking about trying to bring humanity center design across the world. And I found another group, which is called um, Commit Global, which is working with immigration crises around the world. They say they helped a million people. They're partnered in part with the United Nations. And so they're going to be at the conference. Aga Khan is going to be at the conference. Um, uh, two of the applications I got were from Tijuana, Mexico. And they look they kind of related. And it turns out they're both group of things called um, um, core, core 32. So I said, I'm not sure you qualify as early career because you're working with this other organization. But this other organization is wonderful. And so I, I invited them to come to the conference and tell us about the work they're doing in, in, in Mexico. And so we're trying to bring together, and I'm almost every time I go someplace, I learn of new groups. The meeting I was at in Boston was a, the International Congress called the Design Research Society. There's usually in Europe. This was the first in the United States. So I had people from all around the world, and I've learned about even other groups doing these very same things. Now, the United Nations is a list of 16 societal, what they call it, sustainable development goals. And those are the ones that I'm after. Now, the, actually, the United Nations says we have 17, but it's only 16 are the real goals. 17 is what I'm doing. Number 17 says, and this is to Jeremy's point, these projects are, these issues are so large that no single group can really accomplish it. And so there are lots of small groups working on these areas. And number 17 is we must all band together to solve this and so one of the things I'm hoping uh, is that after this first conference we have in San Diego, we're going to do it again and again and again. And this will lead to a society where all the people doing humanity center design every year get together to share their knowledge and their approaches as learning tools, not as bragging tools, as learning tools. 
Wonderful. That's that's amazing. I mean, I th I think what what's great about that is it, it's a place where people can see this stuff being applied and being successful, not only in their individual ventures, but collectively rising to say, Hey, look, you know, there's a new better way to do this with a long range mindset. Right. So, uh, definitely keep us posted on that, man. I think, I think Mark and I would love to highlight some of the folks that are, um, that are doing great things with them. Yeah. Maybe the people that you award, maybe we, maybe we come out to the conference and interview them or something or do something like that. But I'd love to highlight the success in the philosophy because that's what people look towards. It's the action. It's the outcome that's coming out of it. Are you guys planning to track outcomes over time as well? Well, the, the, we'll see we the outcomes. outcomes. It'll be in real time. We'll, we'll know yeah. if it's working. No, we're hoping, we're hoping that we'll have a history and that we're going to, that we hope that to be able to continue to mentor the people who receive these early awards, but that over time, the, all the advisors that we have and, and, the, and the people who've won awards, they become themselves mentors and facilitators. And I'm hoping to grow that. But the truth is for this first year, <laughs> our job, we're struggling to get this, the, the first year done because it's, it's a new program. And so there's a lot of, <laughs> I sometimes complain. I say, I was really great that you honored me with this, uh, with this award program, but you never told me it was going to be a full-time job for me. It's, and it's a more than, if it's full-time, I don't mean 40 hours a week. I mean, 80 hours a week, but it's, it's rewarding. It's really wonderful. And when I read some of the applications recently, it, it, it was emotionally draining, uh, for good reasons. I just said, wow, look at what they are doing. And some people are doing things that never occurred to me that we would, people could do and it's and this has really been wonderful people are yes, amazing. No, november 14th and 15th come and if anybody wants to learn about it the the url is very simple it's the don norman design award that's d n d a dot design we'll spread that out there and i think you mentioned that you went to geneva and they were you told them this isn't human-centered design this is humanity-centered design and i i just think out there as you say, people are amazing, and there are people who are doing this, and they don't realize perhaps that they're this is humanity centered design. No, I think they, they they knew what they were doing. They just didn't know there was a name for it. Oh yeah, but, I mean, like other people that you know, it, there's a band, a, a group, of, a lot of you doing this, and th this. Will oh yes, yeah, so that a lot of most of the people sending in submissions, they don't know they're doing humanity centered design. Yeah. But 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 when I because the as they fill out the forms and stuff it explains what this is about. And if they do reading and so on, they say, oh yeah, that's what we're doing. Because awesome. again, I'm proud of the fact that in this book, the new one, in many ways, there's nothing new. And I say that's good because it isn't just me making this up. Uh, what's new is the way I put it together. And so I put together this system, which I call humanity center design, but it's, it's not out of my, just out of my mind. It's out of what, there's a field called collaborative design or co-design or participatory design that's been around for 30, 40 years. And that's exactly what principle five is. And the other principles, everybody is saying that we can't just manufacture things without worrying where the material came from or what, what kind of, what we do to the atmosphere and land and water, that's been said for a long time. So all these principles exist. What I did was put it together in a different framework. So in my book, I cover economics and I cover uh, manufacturing and the circular economy and I cover the humanity center design. That's only one of the many approaches. And I talk about a wide variety of things, always using examples that of what other people are doing, again, to say, hey, it isn't just me. But again, I'm giving it a framework and I'm saying that in many ways, these are all design issues and why doesn't the design discipline take over? But the design discipline is weak and unempowering because the designers love their craft so much. There are very few designers at the chief design officer level of a large company, very few. Why? Engineers get up there all the time. Why not designers? Oh, we have to know about politics. Yeah, of course you do. Because politics, good politics is simply when different people of different views 
quite often, though each each of these contradictory views is correct because if you look at it from their vantage, vantage point, their point of view. And so what we have to do in good politics is try to understand those different points of view and then work with everybody to find a way that works well, that, that everybody is happy with. Sometimes it's a compromise or everybody gives up something. But actually, if you understand those different views before you start your design work, you can often think of a way, you're creative designers, right? You can think of a way that satisfies everybody without compromise. So we have to learn to work with other people with different points of view. Yeah, I think we talk about this a lot too on the show, and you know, a lot of the work I do uh, on on my own is is this idea of you know empathy being the catalyst uh, to inspire things like this, right? In order to in order to do the things that you want to do on a humanity centered design, there has to be an activation of empathy, and I think we as humans can 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 get better at that. But I have a question for you related to like you know the big we talked to a lot of change agents. You are certainly a an agent of change, um, and change happens from the outside in and the inside out of these big systems right and these uh, design awards that you're doing the highlighting stuff is is i look at it kind of an outside in the inside out is like what would your ask be from you know chief product officers at major enterprises and also like aspiring product designers as they come up the chain to try to affect change in these large political systems and enterprises you have to improve your education, what you know about, because it isn't enough to go to a company and say, oh, I have an idea for a new product. Um, you have to know how to talk to your to your bosses. And, you know, in design, we say you, should ne you really need to understand the people you're building for. And so we go out and send out the anthropologists, or we send the designers out to be with the community and understand the community. Well, but some of the people you're building for is the people you work for. So why don't you understand their language? And uh, their language, look, they're very much worried about cost because uh, they're selling their products and they need to make a profit or else the company goes out of business and that doesn't do any good. But so they're worried about cost. So you can't go and say, here's a wonderful product. Uh, and what do you show them with pictures of it, models or letters of, from people who think you're you know, a wonderful designer? No, that's not how they make decisions. They make decisions, but they want a spreadsheet showing you the increased costs and maybe increased sales and increased whatever, and show that it's profitable. Well, my design friends always say, well, how would we know those numbers? We've never made this thing. We don't know what the sales will be. Well, marketing does this all the time. They make up numbers, they make them up. So you can make them up. And if you don't know how to make them up, ask marketing to help you. And, and the executives who are looking at this, they're smart. They know you made up the numbers. That's what they used to do themselves. So they say, so where did the numbers come from? What assumptions were you making? Are those reasonable? And then they can judge. And you like to tell stories? Yes, stories are very important. But give them the numbers and then tell them a story that shows a context in which what you're trying to do would have fit because the combination is very powerful. Now, one of the manufacturing methods that is really the one that we need all to do is called circular economy, where we reuse things, we make things that last longer, that are easier to repair, uh, and that, are, that when they break down and you finally have to replace them, you can take them apart and reuse the components. And there are a number of companies already doing that, but it's going to change, it's, it's expensive. And so companies will resist it. They'll say, it's a really excellent idea. We love that idea, but it will cost more money to do that. And we make our money by selling products. And now you're not, you're saying they're not going to be as many. <laughs> if, if they don't buy a new product every two or three years, how will we stay in business? So you have to change the business model. And there are answers. The most, the most common answer is, well, we're going to sell services. You know, we used to sell, that's how telephones used to be in the old days you went to the phone company you say i'd like a phone and they, and they would charge you a certain amount per month and they would give you a phone and they would maintain it and fix it if it broke and it wasn't your phone it was theirs they offered that service and today we actually we think we're buying the phone but if you think about it we're not really buying because we go to the <laughs> we go to the cell phone company and they say hey, there's a special price and you can buy it but in two years, you can get a new one, get a new one. They're offering a service. And so 
that's the way. But you, if you want to change things to the company, you have to understand how the company works and present a solution, first of all, that is sensible for the company that they can understand. And second of all, in the language that people understand, which is going to be, um, they will love to see the product. They do want to know what it will do to people, but they want to know how does it impact our cost structure. So you have to know how to do that. And But, you know, engineers were trained just, just in engineering, just as narrow as designers are trained just in design. And the ones who moved over the top, they expanded their own knowledge. I'm a good example. I, I When I became a, an executive at Apple, I was pretty clueless. And I learned by asking people questions. I learned by living through difficulties and problems. I I just, I thought that the, the marketing people were, how did you do those impressive analyses and talks and so on? And they would laugh at me and they said, there's no magic here. And so they, 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 they explained what the tools they were using. So much so that eventually after I had left and was a professor doing a design program at Northwestern in the computer science department, but for Julio Otino again. And I, what I was doing was a joint program with the, with the MBA program at Northwestern where I taught design. So uh, that meant I had to understand how businesses work, which I do because I worked in several different businesses. It is it, a lot of this. I always try to think about it. It, it really points down to long range thinking and not in not today thinking and immediate returns. And, and that's just the philosophy of the business world is sell the product and what are the quarterly returns and, and the pressure to do more and do more, whether, you know, I think it's a quantification of instead of making the metrics, Hey, I'm a $2 billion company. Instead, maybe I'm a $500 million company, but we've done X, Y, and Z to make the world more livable. And I, I don't know that maybe there's that <laughs> dashboard that you're talking about. I don't there know. are, there are companies that do this. And of course the, 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 common one that people love to talk to is Patagonia, which, uh, which says that's their principles and uh, that if you buy their clothes, they're mostly um, camping, hiking, but uh, clothes, but actually that are popular in everyday life, not just for those uh, activities. If it gets ripped or torn or something, send it back to us. We'll fix it and send it back to you. When it's old, when you're finished, it's, when it's too badly damaged that can't be used it again, send it back to us. We we'll, we will reuse the components in new clothes. And uh, and moreover, its company is owned by the uh, employees, and it's a B corp. It's not a C corp. The C corp is that Milton Friedman once said the company owes its responsibilities to its shareholders, not to its employees, not to its customers, not to the place where it's located. Well, first of all, that's not a law. It was just a, his opinion, but it has become a law and uh, it's become in, ingrained in the court system. So a B Corp uh, is one that says, no, it's uh, we owe our responsibility to the world, basically. A B for better, we're gonna be a better company. And so, uh, yeah, I um, love it. And it, it uh, those yeah. companies are emerging, and I think that I mean Patagonia is one. I don't know if there's any others out there, but I think that we we talk on this show often about the impact on the next generations of what's happening. And I think that we have a very ecologically minded group of millions of billions of people who maybe we'll see, hopefully, see more of those B Corps very soon. Um, See, a million people isn't enough. When we have 8 billion on the population, a million is in the round-off era. It's, you know. Or billions then. It's, it, I, I love your optimism. I love your, this, this philosophy. I think it resonates with a lot of people, most people listening to this, I think. And it's, it's just refreshing to see that there is a structure that we could implement today to make things better. Yes. And by the way, another thing is the educational system. I'm, a, I'm starting to write an article with a good friend who works at the National Academy of Engineering against STEM, why we are against STEM. Uh, mm. And both of us are highly educated in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. What we're against is, well, first of all, there's no people in there. Now, the solution is not to add A so it's STEAM or add H so it's STEAM or something, humanities and arts. 
the the principle is to teach differently, uh, and the way because at the moment we still teach science separately than technology, than engineering, the mathematics, and within science there are all the different disciplines, and they, each one is taught separately. Whereas if you're trying to build something and change the world, it comes together. So we, I think, we should not teach disciplines; we should teach problems. Because if you teach about problems, you automatically have to bring in all the disciplines, including history, including the humanities. And I tell people, you know, we have to understand people. So where do you understand people? Not from psychologists or sociologists or anthropologists. You understand people from people who write novels. You can't a write a story. novel without understanding people because you, the people who read the novels have to say, yeah, I know people like that. I really hate them or I really love them or whatever. And so I want to bring this together. And, you know, the, the country I've discovered that is doing the most innovative types of education is India. They're developing all new schools all around, and they're doing what's called a liberal education. So instead of majoring in some very narrow specialty, you're, they're trying to give it all to you at once, but it's not, not as separate courses, but bring them together to know you know how they're integrated. Because when I was a student, I went to MIT, my first course, first uh, college. And um, so I learned the mathematics. And I don't know why I'm learning it. But in the physics and engineering courses, I start to use that same mathematics. And that made it easier to understand why I was trying to learn the mathematics, except they weren't in sync. Quite often, the, uh, the engineering course would teach me the mathematics before the mathematicians got there, or vice versa. Why, doesn't, why shouldn't it have been taught as one course? or one sequence where they work together. And it's hard because in an existing university, professors don't want to change what they're doing. They get promoted because of their excellence in a narrow discipline, and they love to teach what they know. So it's only new universities that are capable of changing the way that they teach. And I love the liberal education that's going on in India, and in a few places in the United States as well, and in Europe. But it's harder to do it in an established uh, university as much because you don't know that professors often run the university. And professors are incredibly conservative. And part of it is the reward structure. They're rewarded on getting pi papers published in these wonderful specialized journals. Yeah. Yeah, you, this you, you mentioned new new universities, new companies. I think there's this yeah this call for something new <laughs> everywhere, not universities, companies, people. But yeah, bring in the new out of the old. New I love forward. the idea. Love the idea of like rooting it in a problem, right? Starting with the problem and showing how all the disciplines can kind of cycle in and coordinate within that. Because we're yeah, the the best problems are solved by coordination by. Uh, listening to other people by by you know living in between these disciplines. That's where like the magic happens. That's amazing. Speaking of issuing problems and, and challenges, uh, like we and, and Don, this has been an amazing conversation and in, in, in uplifting in a lot of ways, but also kind of like big thinking because it's complex. We're trying to change something that's very complex, and I love that you're you're doing it. What would you? We like to string these shows together, right? What question? would you leave and it can be on any topic anything that's on your mind to continue the conversation in this thread with our next guest what question would you ask them well there are lots of lots of questions that get raised by what i'm doing lots of questions in my own mind we don't really know how this is going to turn out um you also told me that you're going to start moving into quantum computing and um so i would ask at least it isn't AI. <laughs> um, AI, actually, the question is easier. But with quantum computing, it's it's an entirely new way of computation. It's going to require us to rethink a lot of what we know. And um, it, when it works, it still is not quite workable. Um, it's going to be able to solve really complex problems much well, the first of all, can solve it, which we can't do today. And it'll solve it more quickly than things that are done today. It doesn't solve everything. In fact, you really need a, a traditional computer to, to control the quantum computer. Uh, they have to work in pair. But um, what, what new kinds of benefits to humanity will come about by this new form of computation? 
because almost everybody talks about cryptography and how this will change cryptography. Okay, okay, but what about, what else? What else is it going to really make a difference in in people's lives? Fantastic question. Um, I'm just curious. You said that the AI question was easier, so maybe we could borrow two questions from you, Don. What was your AI question? A major problem in today's large language models and related work is that there's no understanding. It's a pattern match system. Now, it's very powerful and does wonderful things, but it's kind of constructing pixel by pixel or word by word things that that fit the pattern of what's already been produced. And so each one is logical and each one makes sense. And that's why it comes out with wonderful pictures and wonderful things, but not necessarily making any sense whatsoever, including what we call it. You know, I, at the conference, I, someone said, uh, this hallucination that these models do, that's not hallucination. That's actually exactly how it's supposed to work. It's supposed to be generating things word by word in, in a way that's sensible and logical, but doesn't necessarily have to be truthful. That's how they're designed. But um, but we need a different system, obviously. We can't rely upon that as in part of our search mechanisms. Maybe it's good for creativity, and I think it is, and it could be powerful. And I think we have to just, the other thing that I see happening, look, we're in the middle of a number of technological revolutions. Quantum computing is one, the modern AI is another, but all sorts of new materials, including ones that are going to be uh, more biologically uh, you know, benign. And we have also new sensors, sensors from outer space. We can see all sorts of wonderful things about the earth, but sensors on the body, we can understand medicine better and the internal workings of your own body, which will really dramatically help medicine. AI is already starting to help develop uh, new kinds of medicines in a more systematic uh, approach. Uh, we also have new methods of communication, new methods of travel. Uh, almost every device in the future is going to have not only CPUs in it, but batteries and motors in it. And if you look at robotics, some of the modern robots are unbelievable in what they can accomplish. And now when we add the AI models into the robotic models, the large language models and related stuff into them, that's going to be changed both. Because the way that people learn is by interacting with the world. We learn our cause out the notion of causality by what happens when we see and observe in the world, and when once our machines start doing that, that will change everything. So we're in very exciting times, and I think there'll be many, many developments. But the one thing that seems to be absent from a lot of this is the notion of ethics and what we should be doing and not doing, and that's very important. And we saw that in the development of large language models, where the technologists said well, we have to train them on something, so we'll, we'll have it read all the stuff that's been written, or how do you make decisions, loan decisions in a bank? Well, well, we'll train them on the way they've made successful loan decisions without any recognition of the fact that, you know, maybe those bankers have always been biased towards a certain type of individual and they neglected others. And uh, the same is, what's a criminal and not a criminal? Well, we'll look to see where, look what the criminals are, have done and what the non-criminals have done. Well, again, the, the justice system has been biased. And so you see those results. So we need to have much more attention to this. But I think that people are, have learned that the hard way, unfortunately. But now it's about time that we had, if you will, people who study ethics. They exist, they're, they play a very important role already in medicine but they've got to play an important role in all these new technologies that we're developing. Couldn't agree more, Don. Yeah. Uh, fantastic conversation. And, and and that's exactly what we on the show have been trying to explore. We've got a great episode actually in the past with Reed Blackman, who's an yeah. ethicist that explores uh, ethics and AI, but this confluence of technology and what it means to us as humans and our society and our future, that's what we're trying to do. And that's why we're so glad you were able to shed some light on a lot of your work and we really appreciate you being here today. Yes. Thank you. Mark, any closing thoughts before we get out of here? Um, it's, it's been wonderful. I'm, I'm going to watch it all back and I'll, I'll give you my closing, closing thoughts next week. Um, just a quick shout out for the book club. If you, we spent, about 12 weeks reading Don Norman's book, The Designers Everyday Things. So if you go to thinkingonpaper.xyz, you can learn more about that chapter by chapter breakdown. 
And at the moment, we're reading The Order of Time by Carlo Rovelli as part of our quantum season. So again, thinking on paper X, Y, Z, I'll do a big write-up of this. We'll try and get the word out for your conference, Don, try and get some more eyes and ears onto that. I think I speak for everybody here. Let me just I comment. Take... Let me just comment on the order of time. I that was an amazing book because it it completely destroyed what I thought time was about. It uh, it was he's a really great writer, and on top of that, he's an important physicist in that field. And um, I didn't realize. I know that time is complex, but I never realized how complex. Well, we have one more chapter to read in that book, Don. So if you're free and available next Friday to speak about time travel, we'll, 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 <laughs> you're more than welcome to come on the show and try and help me and Jeremy understand a little bit more of what we're reading in that book. Um, I think I speak for everybody here when I say thank you. Thank you for your books. Thank you for Humanity Centered Design. What you're doing is powerful. It's important and appreciate you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, good. You. And thanks everyone for listening. Be curious, stay disruptive. Keep and thanks, Jeremy and Mark, for a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Take care. Bye bye.